Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me for our very first East Asian seminar series hosted by the Asian Institute here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. My name is Diana Fu. I'm an associate professor here at the Monk School and in the Department of Political Science, and I study Chinese politics, and I'm the director of the series. I am so pleased today to welcome a panel of distinguished um, fellow colleagues, but especially experts on uh, China's climate change and China's environmental policies. We are really joined by some of the top China environmental experts today to discuss the opportunities and constraints in China's role to curb the current climate crisis. I can think of very few uh, global issues as pressing as the climate crisis, especially as we have come out of just a sizzling summer with world record, um, with record high temperatures around the globe. And environmental governance has been trumpeted as one of the areas for cooperation between China and the West. And yet this cooperation is not always easy to achieve uh, given unabated political tensions. So today we're going to be talking about that with three of our panelists. So allow me to briefly introduce them. We have Denise Vanderkamp, who is an associate professor in political economy of China at Oxford University. Her research examines environmental policy, regulatory uncertainty, and bureaucratic governance in China. Originally from Hong Kong, she received her PhD from UC Berkeley and has lived and worked in China, Tajikistan, Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom. So a real, a real global citizen. Uh, we are also joined by Isa Yue Ding, who is an associate professor of political science at Northwestern University. She is a scholar of comparative politics, Chinese politics and environmental politics. Dr. Ding is the author of a fantastic book called The Performative State, Public Scrutiny and Environmental Governance in China, just out last year with Cornell University Press and her ongoing research covers global environmental movements, China and the world, and the politics of ideas. We are also joined by Juliet Liu, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Forest Resources Management and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. She is a political ecologist focused on the implications of China's growing investments in land and other resources in Southeast Asia and beyond. Dr. Liu's research examines conflicts and governance issues around resource extraction and intensive land use. So you see, we have a very diverse panel uh, with diverse um, backgrounds, and I would very much encourage the audience to take advantage of this opportunity to ask questions uh, using the Q&A um, function at the bottom. You can ask questions and send in questions at any point during this one hour seminar, and we will leave at least 15 minutes at the end to answer your questions. So without further ado, I would like to pose an opening question to our panelists. You know, is China actually sincere uh, about environmental protection and its commitment to solve the global climate crisis? Uh, Denise, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you, Diana, for that introduction and that very pressing question. Uh, given recent policy reversals that we've seen, a lot of people are asking that question. So, for instance, um, you know, investments in coal-fired power plants, despite China's pledge to peak coal, or also a recent spike in carbon emissions, despite China's pledge to peak carbon within the next few years. Um, and I would say in answer to that, that yes, China is absolutely committed to meeting its climate change commitments. Um, and anyone who doubts that just needs to look at the major investments China has made, not just in renewable energies, but in monitoring infrastructure to see what green firms are doing, to gather data, to check and hold them accountable, and also what it's doing to keep local officials accountable. So how it's changed the whole promotion criteria so that local officials in key cities now, they're promoted based on their environmental performance over economic growth. We never thought we'd see the day when that happens, but it is, and studies are showing that it's working. Officials in these key cities are reducing emissions more than their counterparts. 
So I think the question then people ask is, so why do we see these policy reversals? Um, and in the end, it comes down to, you know, central local politics, the fact that Beijing, however committed it might be, it still struggles to get local officials to fall into line because local officials are protecting their own interests and using information barriers to serve those interests. And, you know, taking the case of coal-fired power plants, this recent spike in investment, a lot of analysts agree that, you know, this is about energy security. China has realized it can't survive on renewables alone, especially after the droughts and blackouts of the last few summers. And it really does need coal as kind of a backup source. So this is not as, you know, focus going forward, but some providing a backup when necessary. And that that is clear that that's what's going on. But then also you need to look at who's investing in these power plants. And a recent study by Jonas Nan showed that actually local governments are a major investor. Um, even when it's a public-private partnership or a private plan, local officials have a huge stake or a, um, a dominant stake in this investment. And in this current environment of economic slowdown or debt, they will be seeking a return on that investment. So it'll be interesting to watch going ahead if these power plants are just used for backup capacity or if they will be used more regularly as a way to recover what they invested in the first place. Um, and more broadly, in, amidst this economic downturn, local officials are struggling with that, that dilemma of, do we you know, pressure polluting firms to reduce emissions, hurt employment, hurt local revenue, or do we ease off so we can start paying off our bills, protecting what our people need? And again, how they manage that dilemma might ex explain why we see a spike in emissions. They're choosing to protect industry at the moment as a way to ease through this transition. So I think there's no question that Beijing is sincere, but the real question is whether their commitments can be enacted on the ground, implemented, given these central local tensions and those implementation gaps that exist in China. Thank you for that opening uh, remark. I found it incredible that um, now local officials in China are incentivized to you know, go green and to um, have environmental performance be a part of their evaluation over economic performance, because for decades, it was really twin things, right? It was economic performance and ability to keep political stability in your area that they were being promoted for. But now you've got environmental governance as kind of a hard standard there. But as you say, that might, uh, even having that incentive there may not always work because they have other incentives and other constraints on their hands. Uh, so Isa, let's turn to you. You're also an expert of, um, of uh, domestic politics in China. Do you think, do you agree with Denise that China is absolutely committed, um, at least at the central level to, um, to going green? Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for having me. Uh, I absolutely agree with Denise that China is sincere. Uh, but then my uh, answer or uh, what I'm going to talk about is why do we ask this question to begin with, right? Is China sincere? Does China care about climate change? Um, it also goes without saying that the word China is very muddled. Um, when we say China, we can mean different actors. Uh, with different intentions and capabilities. So I'm sure in our discussion, uh, especially later on when we talk about the Belt and Road, we're going to be talking about different subnational and non-state actors, but let's for now use China to refer to the, uh, the central government. Um, so it is true that recently um, observers have noted a curious vacuum in how little discussion there is about climate change within China. Um, especially given the rise of extreme weather events in recent years, um, in the past summer, for instance. Um, for instance, I just saw uh, the Reuters reporting um, from last month that, quote, record heat and historical floods in China this summer have failed to ignite domestic public debate about how the world's top carbon polluter can mitigate climate change. Uh, there was no major spike in searches for climate change in recent weeks on Weibo or Baidu, unquote. And this echoes uh, some of the sentiments we see after Kerry's visit to China this July. So for instance, New York Times reports that, quote, China's Xi rebuffs Kerry's call for faster climate action, unquote. So uh, meanwhile, careful observers uh, notice this mismatch between the lack of domestic discourse on climate change 
and substantive policy actions toward climate change, uh, as Denise was just talking about. So after all, China is well on its way to achieve its double carbon goals, the uh, peaking carbon emissions by 2030 and peaking carbon uh, neutrality by 2016. Um, and the national carbon emissions trading market has also been steadily expanding in recent years after it was established uh, in 2021. Um, and when uh, visiting China this summer, I was surprised by the speed at which electric vehicles have been replacing gas-powered vehicles on the streets. So what explains this mismatch? Um, my answer is that this is about the pol this is political and it's about the politics of language. Um, so my research shows, my recent research shows that there is a wide gap between how the OECD countries talk about climate change and how non-OECD countries talk about it. And I'm avoiding the term developing countries because there's a lot of debates over whether China is a developing country or not. And we'll save that for uh, a discussion for another time. But uh, what's really interesting is that domestically, there is very little mention of the word climate change. But if you go around the country, you see propaganda about climate change and environmental protection everywhere without mentioning mentioning the term climate change. So for instance, uh, this notion of double carbon, Shantan referring to the goals of carbon peaking and neutrality uh, made it to the list of the top 10 new terms last year and two years ago, alongside other popular terms like rural revitalization and metaverse. Um, and you know, everywhere when people talk about the double carbon and so on and so forth, and oftentimes recognizing uh, uh, the you know this big policy push as uh, 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 sometimes performative, as my research has argued, um, and the domestic discourse also talks about. Uh, quote, uh, quote unquote, green low carbon transition. It talks about economic transition, technological innovation, energy structural adjustment, uh, development of ecological civilization, so on and so forth. It also talks about fulfilling international promises of emission cuts, and this is in exact words. Um, and it talks about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it very, very rarely mentions the word climate change. Why? Um, as I said, this is language, and I think there are two ways this is uh, the, the politics of language. The first is, um, and this is not unique to China, and my, some of my recent research shows that if you go to the developing world, um, not, we can, you know, we can we cannot count China as a developing country here. Let's talk about Mongolia, a country that I, I've been visiting. So people in Mongolia, right, so if you take the standard uh, questionnaire from, let's say, the World Value Survey or any survey, Gallup, and you go to these developing countries, you ask people on a scale of zero to five, how much, uh, how serious is climate change a problem? And you usually get the answer that climate change is not that big of a problem. But the, the, the problem here is not that people don't care about climate change, is that they don't know this Western jargon, climate change. So people in Mongolia talk about se severe weather, they talk about drought, they talk about uh, losing their animals to Zod, which is their term of, you know, uh, weather disasters. And the same thing, you know, in China, they, you know, people also talk about weather disasters and so forth, right? And, and the same is true for other developing countries. So I think there is, you know, when we ask questions about does China care about climate change, why are they not talking about climate change? Sometimes the answer is just that they're not speaking our language. They, you know, uh, the English language or using uh, 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 scientific jargons in English. And the second is more political. And especially when China is concerned, because obviously it's not that the Chinese authorities don't know the word climate change, right? People might not, but the authorities, they do because China and the central government uses the word climate change much more often on the international stage than on the domestic stage. And the reason is very clear. It's political. It is a politically charged term. Uh, also in domestic politics in the West, right? So climate change is associated with liberal political parties. And therefore, um, I also find in my research, the conservatives in the West, they show more affinity toward the environment once we stop using terms like climate change and renewable energy. And this is the same at the global level. China is very well aware discussion 
around this notion of climate change is very political. It's not just a scientific problem, but because the, the way discourse works, it also speaks to the power relationship between developed, uh, the developed and developing world, and which is why when chi China uses this word climate change really carefully. Um, and then, so, so and uh, when it comes to the relationship between China and the United States in particular, I think the key disagreement uh, here is not whether China will deal with climate change. It is whether climate change is an issue that should be quote unquote freestanding, um, as Kerry said to Han Zhen this summer. So the Chinese government doesn't believe that climate cooperation with the United States can be separate from other aspects of US-China relations. And I think that's the key, right? So when we pay attention to these uh, discussions uh, um, and negotiations and cooperations with climate change, I think we ought to note uh, the politics around that. Um, and that's uh, my, at, at least in part, my answer to this question of does China uh, care about climate change? And my answer is yes, uh, even though uh, they might not be talking about it. Thank you. Uh, that's so interesting that in China, people don't use the word climate change because it's it has Western baggage and it implies certain political alignments or political commitments that Beijing is actually committed to, but just doesn't want to say so in those terms. So speaking of language, um, let me turn to Juliet to ask in in a, you know, one of the projects that the Chinese government has embraced, uh, and, and, and it has used its own lingo to describe this, which is the Belt and Road. And the Belt and Road Initiative, which is still known in Chinese as the Belt, um, uh, the Belt and the Road. Um, uh, can you, one of the developments recently has been the greening of the Belt and Road. So what prompted this shift? And how exactly is China pursuing a greener belt and road? Or is it just talk? Is it just greenwashing? Yeah. Um, so I've been looking at the belt and road since before it was called the belt and road initiative. I had been working in Laos on agricultural investments and I've, I've looked a lot at infrastructure investments, basically things that are um, taking up huge amounts of land. And both domestically and abroad, these are huge sources of China's emissions. Uh, China is domestically the largest food emitter in the world. Um, I think it's about 15% of its um, of, its, of uh, its own emissions. It's the amount of cement that it pours into infrastructure production is, is truly insane. I mean, China pours 60% of the world's cement, which is, I think, just staggering. And cement um, cement is highly emitting. Um, it takes a lot to produce. It takes a lot to keep um, to transport and and but it's at the base of all of the things that Chinese Chinese companies, uh, Chinese infrastructure companies uh, construct domestically and abroad. And so these in, these activities are really big um, footprint activities for climate change, but also for biodiversity loss, um, shifts in in habitat and ecosystems. Um, and also really, really important for human impacts at multiple registers. Um, so having looked at the Belt and Road Initiative for 10 years, it's now the 10 year anniversary um, since it was announced in 2015. Um, I think of the Belt and Road as a, a kind of a, an umbrella slogan for China's global engagements. Um, and so if we look at the Belt and Road Initiative's evolution, how it's grown, it's really diversified. It was announced in 2013. Um, initially, it focused on hard infrastructure. Um, Chinese diplomats were and development organizations insisted that they were going to do it differently than the West. People in, in developing countries wanted things you could feel and touch and see. Um, and they felt that they had a different brand of development cooperation. So over the last 10 years, there's been a big evolution in that from hard infrastructure to to other approaches to do overseas engagements, all of them kind of under this umbrella of the Belt and Road Initiative, which um, Diana, as you mentioned, I mean, I think of it as a discourse, right? I don't think of it as a specific policy. It's never been a formalized policy. They renamed it from strategy to initiative, partly to reduce kind of crazy amounts of backlash to the word strategy, uh, but also because it's, it's, it's an overarching kind of campaign slogan in my mind. Um, so, the ways in which this evolved and that prompted kind of the idea of greening, I think, were partly the fact that they expected to win over hearts and minds just by building roads and sports stadiums. 
Um, domestically, the country's leaders have been so successful at linking visions of state power, national excellence, or modernization with hard infrastructure development. Um, it's really worked domestically and on international audiences, I don't think they realized how unsuccessful that would be on the international stage. So the sea, feel and touch, hard infrastructure emphasis just didn't help China win it was over as many hearts and minds as they expected. There was huge amounts of backlash to the environmental impacts of uh, Chinese infrastructure investments. Um, where I work in Laos, hydropower dams uh, have been built by other organizations like the World Bank, but China became such a focus of hydropower's negative environmental and social impacts. And I think globally, there was this kind of broader chorus of seeing Chinese infrastructure projects um, not through that nice lens that they they enjoy domestically as like a, a sign of progress, but as really, really impactful. Um, and so partly because of that backlash, and I think also because of the real costs that a lack of buy-in, um, a huge amount of negative impacts um, incurred for Chinese companies, firms themselves were, were facing so many delays and so many kind of kind of increases in costs from both a lack of social buy-in um, and also just from learning how to operate it overseas in these sectors that require huge amounts of paperwork, huge amounts of planning, huge amounts of investment, that the shift in 2017 towards um, Xi Jinping announced the greening of the Belt and Road Initiative was a really major and really real shift. I think the country was seeing risks both from the environmental and social impacts of its push for hard infrastructure. Um, and so I think that was a big, um, a watershed and change. And, you know, the so I think that's what prompted the shift. I think there were general genuine costs, both diplomatically, reputation wise for the country and also costs for the firms. Um, but I think when we think of whether it's just greenwashing, I think it is a real kind of reaction as as um, as Diana and, and Isa have talked about in in other ways, you see real kind of matching of of policy actions with um, with what has been declared as as an overall greening, you know, it's not just greenwashing. Um, there's been a push for green finance, there's been a support for increasing sustainable pro, um, projects, even earlier in the pipeline. So recently, there was an announced multilateral cooperation center for development finance is doing this investment in like the earlier pre-project assessment and planning stages to make sure sustainable projects get a boost in kind of just generating a pipeline of them. Um, and there's been a shift towards small is beautiful is what it's being called um, Xiao Arme. So that's more of an approach to lending towards less towards these massive infrastructure projects um, and really overall, this was happening even since before the greening of the Belt and Road was announced, the BU Center um, for Develop, uh, sorry, the BU Global Development Center has kind of tracked a peak in overseas um, investments in 2016. So that was before the greening. Um, but we're seeing a shift in Xiao Arme from, from the huge sectors uh, of extraction, pipelines, transport power they're shifting kind of towards smaller projects, less environmentally impactful projects, things like transportation and other and other types of investment. Um, but whether China can really green the Belt and Road, I mean, I think, sorry, to kind of end with the first question you asked, what I think is really important to say is that um, China works in some of the most non-green uh, sectors. It has a comparative advantage in the most highly impacting sectors in terms of environment and society and social impacts. So I also think that as as green and as good as these projects can get, China is has a comparative advantage in and the world is demanding infrastructure development that is inevitably really bad. And so I do think what, when the framing is the, the common framing of is China green? And when we have panels that are always focused on, on China, which I think is really necessary, I think the key shift when we answer that question is that a lot of these projects like dams and railroads and roads are in demand, but they can only be so green. And we need to look at whether China is any worse than a road built by an Indian company. Um, of, is a Swedish tree plantation, eucalyptus plantation, any worse than a Chinese eucalyptus plantation? 
And I think the answer is sometimes they're equally bad. Um, so you're looking for a lesser of two evils. Um, and, and so keeping the environmental impacts of infrastructure always um, in focus as the, the more important question than the national, like which nationality of, of firms are doing better or worse. I think that is ultimately the the kind of comparison we have to keep in mind when we when we assess how China is doing when it's greening its own investments. That's terrific. Um, I like the phrase "small is beautiful," small but beautiful. And <laughs> for yeah. students that are here, it would be uh, a really important catchphrase to remember that. Yeah, I mean, dams and roads can only be so so green. So if you're mostly building in those areas, you can't expect China to be completely green. Uh, Denise, let's turn back to you. You mentioned earlier about um, uh, about these efforts um, by the Chinese government to actually gather data on uh, these efforts, these initiatives that local governments are taking to clean up um, the environment. So is this data gathering actually revolutionizing China's ability to control environment uh, to, to control the environment, to control pollution? Um, and how much of this data is publicly accessible to us? Um, how much of it is actually transparent? Because we, we do know that um, data can be gathered, but it's not always accessible to uh, those on the outside. Thank you, Diana, for those very um, on-point questions. I think especially you know in this era of big data, everyone thinks maybe big data can solve everything. Um, and one area might be environmental implementation. And on at surface, it's on the surface, it seems like that. So, um, starting in 2012, all major emitters were required to install devices that measured in real time what their emissions were by various categories. So not just the top, you know, like sulfur dioxide, but also different types of emissions. And it was very patchy at first when I was there in China. It was hard to find this data. It was hard to know who was using it. It's expanded a lot since. Um, it now covers the majority of industrial emitters. 75, the, the statistics I saw was 75% of total industrial emissions in China are now monitored by this real-time emissions monitoring scheme. So you're, you've got local governments, regulators, even at the top level that are getting in real time what these firms are doing. And so you can understand why people think, well, this will just revolutionize the way environmental policy is implemented. You know what firms are violating the laws, and then you also know which local officials might be protecting firms as a result so that you can more streamline the punishment, be a lot more targeted, and then also ease off. So in my own work, I talk about blunt force regulation, where the state, because it doesn't have enough information, shuts down entire industries at once in order to clean up the air. Well, with better data, in theory, you can now avoid that because you can target the sanctions on those who violate or target the local officials who are not complying more specifically. Um, and then what I've also found is recently, so you know, blunt force regulation, entire city or industrial area might be ordered to shut down. But starting in 2018 or 2019, they created this exempt list where factories that performed really well on their environmental area, they were exempt from these shutdowns. And so you can see how that would be very appealing for some firms, you know, if I can do well, if I can meet the green targets, then I will be spared this horrible thing that happens to all my peers. And again, it's data that facilitates that having that real time emissions data to know who should belong on the list. Um, but the problem is, you know, based on my, my research and looking into this, there's still a lot of discretion in that process of how data is used. So to your question, how much is this data available? Data on air quality is widely available in China. How accurate it is, we don't know. We've got students um, all over who are looking at how this data is gamed and played, but it is made public. But this data on key monitored enterprises, to my knowledge, is not publicly available. Or if it is, it's very hard for people to access. And so you can't get this bottom up scrutiny where people use that data to put pressure on firms and local officials to try and hold them to account. It's really up to the people in power to decide what to do with that data. Um, and I have seen cases before where citizens would then go out and collect their own data. So really smart scientists, even professors, would go to the factories that were violating, collect that data at night, and use that to try and hold local officials accountable, maintain the sustained protest. And yet, as we know, local officials in China are so adept at managing this kind of pressure. They know how to deflect protesters, you know, dissemble, say, mm, maybe that data wasn't quite right, let's try it again. 
delay. And as a result, people lose their sense of initiative. These protests die away. And so again, data itself can't fix that problem. As for the exempt list I was talking about, well, I went into it a little more deeply and I realized in some provinces it is. Um, in theory, based on which firms are performing well in the environment. But in others, I realized that firms were snuck in there based on, you know, being very big employers or being important to society. And these are obviously very, you know, important categories, but you can sneak in a whole lot of firms under those phrases, important to society. So it could be that the local official sneaks in a firm that is a close crony or that he has a stake in. And so again, we see this political discretion pervade that process so that even though the data is available, it might not be used properly or political interests still take over. And that's why I don't think more data or better data is the silver bullet. What we really need to do is figure out how discretion undermines or thwarts that process or how it continues to pervade so that implementation doesn't turn out the way the center won. Absolutely. And thank you for making the case for the relevancy of people like us who study politics, because it isn't just about um, data solving everything, but it's about how you gather the data, uh, how you use the data, how the data is hidden, how the data is manipulated. Um, and all of these uh, human intricacies that are involved in data management uh, and uh, that goes into whether or not you achieve the targets that are meant to be achieved. Um, I wanted to turn to Isa, um, and I, I have a, sort of a two-part question. One is a follow-up on the last point that I think um, was very important that Denise made, which was that, yes, we have this data. However, it really is up to the center to reinforce or to enforce rather um, these punishments at the local level. There is really a shortage of bottom up um, mechanisms whereby ordinary people, because they can't access the data, they can't really actually hold firms accountable. And because you also study a bit of social movements, and I've got some students who are interested in social movements as well, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the changes in terms of grassroots mobilization around environmental issues in China under Xi Jinping, um, uh, you know, in the, in the past um, 10 years or so. Uh, and then the second part of the question is also a follow up to your previous discussion about carbon emissions. Um, just how how well is this uh, national emissions trading scheme that has been implemented in 2021, two years onwards, how well is it going? So first about mobilization and second about um, this trading scheme. Mm -hmm. Thank you for these questions. So on the first question, I have to admit, I actually know more about mobilization outside of China than inside of China. And I think for for reasons that you probably know better than I do. Uh, but I'll say, uh, I'll say, uh, maybe make two observations and uh, not systematic answers to your question, because I, I've not studied this uh, systematically, but two observations I uh, I've uh, made in the past few years. And the first is I think uh, there are different types of environmental movements. Um, um, so in, in this case, when we think about um, you know, people uh, who are seeking redress for, uh, let's say, you know, pollution, uh, industrial pollution and damaging um, you know, their local soil or water and so on and so forth. And then there's uh, other environmental groups such as uh, uh, animal rights people, people who are trying to advance um, ecological diversity and then so on and so forth. And what I've noticed is that a few years ago, I, um, you know, I, I visited China and then that, this is when obviously observers outside of China have been talking about uh, the disappearing of NGO activities um, and so on and so forth. And I think it generally is true, uh, but I, I, I also noticed it, it was really interesting in that the, the biodiversity people uh, uh, within China seem to tell me that uh, uh, they've been able to operating uh, uh, and uh, pushing for their agenda quite well in recent years. I think it depends on what kind of environmental movement. Um, and then secondly, it's uh, really interesting. I was in China this summer um, talking to people uh, working the NGOs and, and one of them did mention to me, it has been 
uh, more difficult doing stuff within China. This is an uh, environmental NGO. Uh, so one of the things that they're going to do is that they're going to zhou chu chu. They're going to uh, expand their operations and perhaps go to Africa and then do stuff outside of China. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then on the second question of the uh, uh, national uh, carbon trade emission system, it is it's it has been steadily expanding. Uh, a few years ago, I've written about this, saying that um, you know at the time I observed this was the 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 policy that's in pilot stage. One of the policies that's been in pilot stage for the longest in reform China because it's it, you know started the pilot in early 2000s and it was still a pilot um and then obviously this stopped to be the case and and you know the national market uh opened in 2021 and then and uh, now there is the the uh the carbon trading center in Shanghai and so on and so forth and as soon as you have those things uh, you 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 have actors that um uh, that are built around these institutions that have an interest in, in seeing these institutions continue and 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 especially powerful actors in finance and so, so on and so forth and when i was writing about the the ets pilots years ago i said um you don't see much market mechanism obviously theoretically speaking from the perspective of economists when you have ets it's to let market drive price fluctuation so as to uh, achieve market efficiency so uh, there's not as much market efficiency um so when i uh, did interviews for uh, uh, this earlier publication, I definitely saw that local governments in these pilot regions were, uh, you know, uh, making calls to enterprises, say, this is how much you sell, this is how much you buy, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it, there is trading, but there is there wasn't as much market. And I will say, this still does seem to be the case. So we see increasing volume, but this volume is very, very steady. Um, and then we do see this uh, gradual increase in carbon price. But again, uh, I, I don't know how much market mechanism there is. And I think the reason this institution continues is obviously path dependence, right? At this point, um, you know, to be honest, I don't care anymore whether you know, this is about market efficiency, whether market is driving the, the, the selling and the buying, right? I think for me, as long as, you know, it, it achieves the the uh, the carbon goals, that's fine. You can call this, you know, uh, uh, you can call this market mechanism. You, you don't have to call this market mechanism, but I definitely, at least based on uh, what I'm seeing right now, I, I still don't see as much market mechanism driving these activities, but there is definitely increasing uh, trading, increasing uh, volumes of carbon being being bought and sold. Just a quick clarification: If it is the case that there is no mark or there's very limited market mechanisms at work, then are we seeing more of like a command economy mechanism of in this trade? Like, what is substituting for the market mechanism in these trades? You could call this command. So basically. Uh, the government would say, okay, you know, this is how much you, I think based on my conversations with enterprises, the incentives to, well, there, there are increasing incentives to engage in these trades, um, but, but I think the incentives is quite small. Um, and I think especially in the past when you could just uh, tweak your emissions data, then uh, it, the the monitoring mechanism is not as good. So why would you, if if you can't be monitored in terms of how much you're emitting, then why do you need to go buy these credits, right? So um, it's improving. And, and but now what I'm at least based on the you know few interviews I've done so far, what's happening is the government, the local government would would you know coordinate with the enterprises and say, and then. Uh, and, and not giving directives, but come up with a, a plan and through this negotiation discussion with the enterprises and then to come up with a plan of how much you're buying, uh, this person is buying and how much uh, that person is selling. You could call this command, but it's not a classic command and control, which is to say we're going to reduce 
you know, two tons of carbon this year. And then we're going to divide that into 200 because we have 200 enterprises within our region and everybody's going to reduce this amount, right? So, so now we're seeing more of this, uh, uh, more trading, which is not what happened in the past. But usually when we think about trading the stock market, right, we think it's driven by by market, uh, you know, at least quote unquote market mechanisms, but but we're, it's not like a stock market is, 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 the, is what I'm trying to say, yeah. Got it, got it. And that would actually align with the rest of China's economy in terms of being not quite free market, but the party always has a hand in it. And there's always negotiations and the part in the local state also taking part in those negotiations as well. Um, so uh, I want to turn uh, the one last question to Juliet uh, before we open it up to Q&A from the audience. So we've been talking about, you know, China's it seems like there's a consensus among the three of you that China is serious. It is doing certain things. It can't do everything. But let's just say in a dream world, China did everything logistically possible. It did uh, it did a fantastic job with um, carbon emissions monitoring and this carbon trading scheme is working and it's greening as much as possible in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, can the climate crisis really be solved through China meeting all of these uh, all of these goals and what is beyond China's control? Um, thanks, Diana. What a curveball. I was like, well, I hope I don't get this question. <laughs> um, what I do want to say to twist the is is this for you? I see you unmuted. Okay. Um, no, yeah, go. I just wanted to give you a chance if you had something clear to say to that. Um I so I do think that um, I, when I think of China's sincerity in all of this, and, and this is something that Denise and, and, and Isa have already commented on really well, I think it doesn't matter to what degree China is sincere. I think the match between, obviously, between diplomatic statements and act action is a really important thing to measure. Um, but I think that the world writ large is, is the idea of sustainable development and the idea of needing to combat climate change in a collective way is... Um, is agreed upon at this point. I think it's become a normalized idea um, that has become dominant. And so when I look at the way that Chinese leaders are shifting, I mean, I've, um, as someone that lived and worked in Yunnan province, I've been so excited about the fact that China was um, won its bid to, to host the Convention on Biological Diversity's COP15, which was supposed to be in 2020, but took place in two parts in 2021 and 2022 here in uh, in Canada. Um, I think that the ways it is changing into an environmental leader are marked and important. And whether it's sincere or not, it strategically makes sense for China and for the world. The conditions are such that um, all countries are having to move towards having some accountability in their environmental impact. Um, and, and so I think that China certainly cannot do everything. Um, I, it's certainly not enough. I think that the things that we see shifting are strategically smart for China. They're instrumental, right? Hosting COP15 has been a way that it has promoted the theme of ecological civilization to the rest of the world, um, that it has pitched itself as having successful domestic environmental um, programs. Um, it's a ways, it's a way that it's actually started. Um, some people wonder, talk about this actually the engagement of China as a host has been socializing Chinese actors, right? The, those Chinese actors have to buy into and understand and engage in processes and norms of global environmental governance institutions like um, the UN institutions. Um, and so China is actually also not only promoting ecological civilization, but pitching its own domestic initiatives like a forestation and um, for de desertification efforts, pitching those as under global terms, right? So Isa was, was, was saying like, people don't always use the Western terms like climate change, but things like nature-based solutions, that's been around for 10 years. In 2019, China started calling its afforestation efforts a form of nature-based um, a solution to climate change. So we see a lot of cross-pollination, and I think this is a, a, a trend with momentum that all nations are experiencing. Um, but I think I'll leave it to the other, others to comment and just and just kind of say absolutely not that that is is China's efforts, are they enough um, to really address crises? I think that one of the amazing things about the environment, and I mean, I don't know if this is just... <sighs> 
an echo chamber of people who work on environmental policy, but I have great belief that um, environmental problems are one of the problems where it's really impossible for any certain country to successfully pitch problems as a national issue. Um, I think it's one of those issues that forces international cooperation. And um, and so in that sense, I think it has the potential to be the one, the one in a very narrowing field of areas of cooperation between China and especially the US, but also Canada and other, other countries, one of the few in a very narrowing field of areas in which cooperation is possible because it's so hard to pitch environmental problems as possible to solve without cooperation. Um, but okay, I let, let me pick up, let say. me pick up on that, on, on that. I was just going to bring in the U S and Canada and, and all these other, uh, players in solving the global environmental crisis. Um, yes, agreed. I think, uh, that, um, this is one of the few areas in which cooperation is possible and necessary and perhaps less contentious than other areas, uh, politically than other areas for cooperation. But, um, as Isa, I think you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, when Kerry visited um, earlier this year, it just became very clear that the signaling from the Chinese side was, you know, you can't, you know, you, we can't silo the environmental cooperation. This has got to be part of um, a, a number of issues that um, that we got to bundle together. And some of those other issues are not so easy to cooperate on. And so we've got two questions from the audience that are fairly similar about China's willingness um, to actually co cooperate, collaborate with uh, other other states, and also you could add the willingness and um, ability of um, of other states like the U.S. to collaborate with China as well. Um, how do you collaborate on something if China doesn't? If the Chinese government is saying we don't want to silo climate uh, to something apart from all these other issues that we don't agree on? So, Isa, I think that's for you. Yeah, I think um, it's hard to, you know, read the minds of individuals within the government. I think when we say China, right, so usually what, what, what you'll see is that you talk to both U.S. and Chinese policymakers, they will say, you ask them, okay, in this era of rising U.S.-China geopolitical tension, what are some of the areas in which the US China can collaborate um, and both US and Chinese policymakers will tell you uh, or advisors or people within society would say uh, it's the environment, it's climate um, and perhaps alongside some other issues, but, uh, but environment, climate change is always the first. Um, but then uh, I think people also recognize, right? The, the top, top government level, um, it's impossible to separate um, uh, climate discussions, or, or at least bilateral climate discussions from uh, uh, from these larger political issues, because it, it's really about whether I'm talking to you or not. It's not really, it's, it's about whether we're talking uh, at all, <laughs> instead of what we're talking about. Um, and, and I think I want to, uh, I can also add to what Julia was saying, is that um, when we talk about climate change and what it takes to solve the climate crisis, and I think it's become quite clear and and you know I, I won't mince my words in that I think it it this to actually solve the climate crisis given that some countries are actually going to disappear uh given sea level rises and and given the impending crisis I think it really takes some form of global transfer uh of wealth or payments whatever you want to call it in order for this to happen. And I think this is especially the problem for developing countries um, in, in that, you know, on one hand, people do need roads and people, you know, want to consume more. Um, and, you know, people have not, many people in the developing world have not ever taken a flight. They've not left their hometown to, to visit the capital, right? They want to do that. And it's really hard to make a moral ethical argument against that and say you can't do that. Um, at the same time, these are also the countries that are uh, most severely affected by climate change. So, so in order to both uh, not prevent uh, people in poor countries from having the kind of lifestyle uh, or at least a, 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 a you know the, a decent lifestyle the, the kind of lifestyle a middle class 
um, you know, person in the West will be in the in the OECD countries will be uh, uh, familiar with, and at the same time, you know, prevent their lives from being destroyed by climate change. I think, and and given these are poor countries, I think it really takes some kind of global transfer of money, and for adaptation, um, and. And then this is actually something that's, you know, come up a lot. And I think countries know that. And I think the developed world know that, knows that. And I think China knows that. And I think that's also in part why China insists that it, you know, remains a developing country. Because if you're a developed country, then you have to pay more. But obviously, we also know the, the developed countries are not really fulfilling their prom promises in terms of how much you know money they're transferring it to the to the developing world. So I think uh, you know on this issue, I think what's really going to be the biggest problem is is simply nationalism, nationalism. Uh, in the West, nationalism, right? Think about, you know, what, what the public is, is going to say when Biden says we're going to transfer this amount of, you know, money to Maldives to help them deal with climate change. And the same as within China. And I think the government also, you know, it faces a, a this is, you know, the Belt and Road is not, uh, it, it's not not a sensitive issue within China, especially when you do have a segment of the public questioning uh, especially given recent economic slowdown, questioning, you know, why are we helping Africa when we're not helping ourselves? And obviously, this is how people think, right? You can't really directly engage and say, well, you know, this is helping them, but it's also helping you, and so on and so forth. Right? This is basically people, how, how, how common people think. So I think nationalism uh, uh, everywhere, right? Nationalism uh, in the developed world is going to be the biggest uh, uh, challenge in terms of actually solving the the, the climate uh, uh, crisis. However, that's a very uh, uh, cynical and pessimistic no. But I, I I should acknowledge that you know just given the trajectories of of how uh, uh, the conversations had uh, had at uh, the various previous COPs, and I think we we are you know not completely without hope. I think things are getting better. So. It is okay to be cynical. We are scholars <laughs> after all and critics. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely, and I especially appreciate that you brought up um, that, you know, it's not just China issue. It's like, it's citizens everywhere, not really necessarily voting for global issues or global public goods or voting for, I want my job. I want, uh, you know, I want basic employment. I want um, healthcare on uh, stuff like that. And I think you heard that loud and clear. And the Republican debates in the U.S. Uh, most recently with, uh, you know, why should we support Ukraine? Um, so not to take this too far, but just to say that it's always good to appreciate that Chinese citizens want what um, other citizens want, uh, what Americans want, what Canadians want. And there's not that much difference in that respect in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, the incentives for them to vote uh, for climate issues. Um, so I want to turn to Denise, um, and let's circle back to domestic politics a little bit. There's two questions about domestic politics that I'm going to bundle together. And the first one is about if you could just tell us a little bit about the more recent policies that have been implemented in China, both at a national level and perhaps at a subnational level, um, uh, you know, that, that have had an impact on the environment because you've talked about the cadre promotion. Uh, are there others uh, laws and policies that have been implemented to get uh, really the greening of the ecological civilization realized? And then relatedly, how can climate change policies be effectively implemented nationwide, given that, you know, as Chinese uh, China scholars, we all know that China is so diverse. Uh, each each province is different and has different incentives. And so how how is the government managing that um, internal diversity? Mm. Hey, thank you, Diana, for those questions and also to those who asked them. Um, I think one concern coming out of them was also just this idea that with economic slowdown in China, are they going to, you know, pull off the accelerator on green growth and start focusing on the economy again? And does this mean a reversal in China's development? And also, what does it mean for people on the ground? You know, those who finally were able to breathe clean air for a few years suddenly might find themselves plunged back into serious pollution. 
And I can understand those concerns because for Chinese citizens, it's not just about this nebulous concept of climate change, it's, it's also about pollution in your own backyard. Um, and you ask, so what policies have been implemented to try and you know address this? Or I think a better way to think about this is what's being done so that it can be addressed in a way that China can still continue to grow its economy, protect those interests so people still have jobs. Um, and clearly one is what, what they're doing with renewable energy, right? And how they're trying to green the energy structure um, and then make massive investments in those sphere, try and increase, uh, you know, expand those industries and so that it's not a net loss for the economy. So you're shutting down dirty old industries, but you're growing this new industry that contributes to um, reducing emissions overall. Um, and then when it comes to cleaning up that old dirty industry, as I said, they're using these more targeted measures. So ways where you identify the true culprits and punish them, but those who are trying to um, work harder to meet targets or trying to comply better, you reward them. So in that way, it's not this huge impact on the economy, rather it's just you know the bad citizens that are weeded out. The good citizens can continue to contribute to jobs and to growth. Um, and the ways I see them doing that is really focusing on data gathering, these more targeted incentives for local officials. Um, and then this real push using central inspections. So similar to the anti-corruption campaign, the Beijing will send teams of inspectors around the country to go and investigate what's going on in cities around the country and see where violations are happening and punish the local officials who aren't complying. And so again, it's using that top-down pressure, but this time in a way to really focus on getting local officials to care about the environment. Um, and, you know, it is working. It's still quite blunt in some areas. And one other problem is that it's also made um, implementation a lot more unpredictable. So firms don't know when crackdowns might come out of the blue or when suddenly they'll be forced to do things with, um, out of the blue. And even local officials really don't know when they suddenly might be inspected or suddenly ordered by Beijing to take you know, serious measures on the environment. So it's led to a lot more uncertainty on the ground over when and how enforcement happens. Um, and I think that's not a trade-off that people talk about a lot. They talk about the cost to the economy, to jobs, but they don't talk about the cost to the overall business environment, enforcement uncertainty, and whether that makes firms wary of investing because they really don't know what's going to happen in the future or, or you know, it's made the overall environment more predictable. Um, and so I think if China, you know, continues in that mode, that's a trade-off that it's really going to have to deal with, whether it might be scaring away firms that are green or want to invest um, because it's using these much more unpredictable methods to deal with its environmental problems. Yeah, and when you're talking about firms, are you talking about um, both domestic as well as international firms that are looking to invest in China? Because I would imagine that that those kinds of crackdowns, um, it, well, they're good crackdowns because they're they're for environmental protection, but nevertheless, they introduce market volatility and political risk in such a way that it's hard to predict. Do I actually want to invest in in, in Chinese company that's going to maybe get punished for not? Um, fulfilling these targets? Or, so are you thinking about both sets of actors or largely domestic? Um, so my data is showing that it's both set of actors. So both foreign and private domestic firms respond well when regulation is more stable, predictable, transparent, and built on cooperation trust. Whereas when it's done through these campaign style or out of the blue, very like sudden closures everywhere, you can see decreases in investments across the board in both types. So it's really not that one, you know, private firms are the ones that are more scared or more focused on that. It's across the board that this is happening. And I think that's important information for local officials to take into account. It's not just, you know, the degree, but the manner of enforcement that matters in the future. Right. And of course, that kind of volatility in the business environment and investment environment can also have a direct impact on China's economic growth, uh, both in the short term as well as in the long term. So we, I'm sorry, we've we've got so many interesting questions that I wasn't able to ask all of it. Um, you're such an engaged audience. So thank you for staying with us. And I encourage you to, you know, if you have a burning question to follow up with our speakers who all have public profiles, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer it. And I would just want to thank all of our speakers. All three of you are just so articulate. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to, um, to be interviewing you really. Um, so thank you for joining us. And this, uh, this um, event will be 
made um, uh, will 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 be visible, um, will be recorded, has been recorded, and will be posted on the Monk uh, channel uh, on YouTube. And I want to encourage all of you to join me for our next uh, East Asia seminar series, uh, which will hopefully take place in October. So thank you very much, and have a good night, uh, good evening. Thank you. Thanks for the great question. Good to see you, everyone. Really